That's fine. Thank you for uh, for chiming in. I know a lot of people, most people don't expect to show up and, and, and come on camera like this and have to <laughs> Uh, you know, look, it just makes it a friendlier, nicer environment than just uh, have me talking the whole time. So thank you for doing that. Hi, Daria. How are you? Uh, so I good. I see a few of you now. Uh, Daria, Hi, I'm good. Good. Where I'm, are you um, I'm in London, actually. So. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. So good morning for you, right? It's it's still right. morning for you. Good afternoon for you. Yeah, it is indeed. <clears throat> Boy, I really miss traveling. I would so. How is London? Well, as you have probably heard, it's quite <laughs> quite a thing here. But uh, honestly, I mean, for us, it's it's almost like being everywhere. You need to be, yeah, you need to be at home all the time. You're just allowed to go out for sport reason or to buy any groceries. So nothing really um, very exciting here. Yeah, so. I think. I mean, talk about adaptability and resilience, right? I, sometimes what I think I need to do is to just change the furniture in my room so it's pointed in a different direction. <laughs> so that I have something that feels different. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Cola, Cola Thomas, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing? From the city of Oakland. <laughs> yeah, good. Nice. Nice. Right across the bay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here and to find that this, it's a... Uh, I mean, people from all over the world, England and now. Ooh. Yeah, I know, right? We must nice. be. I'm starting to feel important. <laughs> I, 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 that, probably, that feeling will probably be dashed pretty quickly. Um, good. So uh, Shannon also, uh, Cairns, where are you calling in from, Shannon? Hi, I'm calling in from San Francisco, California. What street do you live on? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you there? Sorry, I just joined. I was actually in yeah. the other room, so well, I didn't hear. <laughs> a funny story about doing one of these calls and having somebody living literally, like I can see their house. Uh, there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm in DeBose Triangle. Where are you? Oh yeah, nice. I'm I am in Coal Valley. So okay, yeah. Oh, you're just around the corner. Yeah, yeah. If the end were running. <laughs> That's right. Just that right through the through the tunnel, and we and we'd be right there. Uh, I'm so happy to see. And, uh, I'm Fulton, so oh, oh you are. That area very well. <laughs> yeah, nice. that's good. Yeah, I still over there. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming on camera. And um, uh, Carly's going to tee up this program here, just basically right now. But while we're on camera like this, I'm going to um, take advantage of the opportunity to call on people occasionally um, to just not. I'm not, not going to put anybody on the spot with anything uncomfortable, but just for some comments, some thoughts. Uh, this wants to be as interactive as we can make it. I'll have some activities and things for you to do as we go along, and of course, I'll be doing a bunch of talking, but. So thanks for coming on camera. If you feel like participating uh, and, and you can, please come on camera as well. And it's nice to see the faces. I certainly appreciate it. With that, let me pass it over to Carly Lutz, our uh, captain today, to take it away. Amazing. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, and thank you for for the warm start to today. That was that was really nice. Um, everyone, if, if I haven't met you already, my name is Carly. I'm our events and community partnerships lead here at Learn It. And with me, I have our events and community partnerships coordinator, uh, Marissa, as well as the lovely Darren, who I'll introduce um, again shortly for those of you who, who uh, don't know him. But thank you so much for joining us for Build Resilience and Adaptability. Uh, this is part of a weekly free community workshop series uh, that we host. We've been hosting over the past about a year and a half now. Um, and so, if you're new to if you're new to Learn It, uh, welcome. We're so excited to have you. If you're a veteran, if you know Learn It well, also welcome back. It's lovely to lovely to see you, and it's been amazing to see people from all over the world tuning in week over week. For those of you that are new to Learn It, uh, just a little bit about us. We are a learning and development organization based out of San Francisco, California. Uh, and we work with companies large and small and also individuals to learn skills for the economy of today and the economy of tomorrow. And uh, so this, this community program is really an extension of our mission uh, to make learning more accessible to everybody and really help us develop the skills that we need to um, really be resilient and adapt in, in today's 
today's workforce and climate. Um, so just a quick refresher on how these work. Uh, these, this is part of a weekly community event series. Our monthly theme for this month is self-leadership. Uh, and these sessions are led by subject matter experts, guest speakers, um, and we also partner with different nonprofits, nonprofit partners. Um, so that proceeds from these events go to um, nonprofit organizations that we work with directly. Um, and I'll speak more on that at the end of the session. Uh, a couple housekeeping items as well. Questions will be taken throughout the session. And as Darren said, these sessions are really meant to be as interactive um, as possible. So please use the chat. If you haven't already, uh, please add where you're from in the chat now. We love to see that. And we just want to make sure the chat is working. So that's that would be great. Um, as well as the recording for this session will be provided in our new community platform called Offsite. So Offsite is our new community platform dedicated to helping you build the skills outside of this virtual classroom. Uh, and I'll speak more on that at the end of today as well. Uh, but just know that the recording and all follow-up resources as well as access to our instructors and, and ways to ask questions will be available on Offsite after the session. Uh, with that, I want to bring it to Darren, introduce you all to Darren. Darren is a Bay Area native and Berkeley, UC Berkeley alum. He's an actor, a leadership trainer, uh, and consultant. Uh, and he most recently joined our team at LearnIt as the Senior VP of Product and Customer Experience. So really uh, honored to have the privilege to work with Darren and see him on screen and now get to work with him virtually here at LearnIt. Um, and Darren has also served on the executive team of uh, top professional skills company and worked with uh, org organizations uh, big and small uh, and has also worked directly with our team here at LearnIt to help develop our, our instructor team um, as well as was the head of faculty development uh, at, a, at a former company as well. Uh, he loves the outdoors. He has a feisty little Chihuahua Terrier. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Darren. Thanks so much, Darren. Thank you, Carly. Okay, so let me uh, grab my screen. My grab control here and throw up my slides for the day. Okay, I think this is looking right. Uh, everybody, give me a, just a thumbs up if you see the slides full full screen. Build resilience and adaptively. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, here we go. I don't know if any of you uh, remember this book, Lord of the Flies. Uh, I had to read it in high school. I, th I have to imagine some of you read this book. And if you did, then I'm wondering if you ever feel like you're working at Lord of the Flies uh, in your actual workplace uh, at times, especially in these very trying times. So what's, what is Lord of the Flies? Why am I talking about it? 1951, William Golding uh, wrote this book. It sold tens of millions of copies. And it's about a pack of British school children who end up marooned on a deserted tropical island. And they don't adapt very well. It's a cautionary tale about the evil that lurks in people's hearts. The boys slowly become more savage. Over time, three of them end up dead. It's a work of but you could kind of imagine something like this happening should a bunch of school let her know. end up marooned on a desert island. Well, what's the real story? The crazy thing is that this actually did happen. Yeah. Not a oh, by the way, if I could ask you, Not I a pass, remember to mute yourself. Yeah, I sent that email about the to the other lady. Wow. She had said I'm sure you don't want the rest of the world to know your conversations. But she ended up saying, do that. Make sure that we're all muted unless it's time to speak. Okay, so this actually did happen is the point. 1965, out of nothing more than sheer boredom, six boys at a... Oop, Darren, I think now you're muted. We can't hear you. You did indeed mute everybody. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. So 1965, 
out of nothing more than sheer boredom, six boys escaped from their boring boarding school in Tonga. They borrowed a boat. They were like 13 to 15 years old, and they decided to just go to Fiji or New Zealand or wherever they bumped into first. They didn't bring a map. They didn't bring a compass. They fell asleep that first night and awoke to a raging tropical storm. The sail broke. The rudder broke. They were adrift at sea for eight days, no food, no water. They came ashore at an island called Atta in the South Pacific. You can actually look it up if you want to right now. This is not a dream island. This is not Gilligan's Island. This is kind of a crummy island uh, with barely any uh, good resources. It was considered uninhabitable. 15 months later, they were rescued purely by accident. And instead of finding uh, emaciated boys who had like, cannibalized each other, something horrible. They actually found, um, what they found was remarkable. They found a food garden, a chicken pen, a permanent fire, a makeshift guitar out of driftwood, a gymnasium with crazy weird make, made up weights and a badminton court. Uh, they were healthy. Uh, one of them had suffered a broken leg and the other ones uh, helped that person took care of it and it healed perfectly. They had arguments, but they had ways that they processed it. They gave, pro processed it. They gave themselves timeouts and things like that. They sang songs to keep their spirits up. They were under very difficult circumstances, were very happy to be rescued. But I think it's a good reminder that the actual Lord of the Fly Flies story, and again, we just have this one example, is, is pretty hopeful. If you think about it, humans are uniquely good at adapting. It's as a species why we are here today. And um, that's the, the, the segue for us to start into this. Th these are trying times and it can be hard to adapt, but it is in your nature to be able to adapt. Um, that doesn't mean that it's always easy and we don't lose our way. Today is going to be about some practical tools and really just being intentional about helping your resilience and your adaptability. But it is something that is available to us. And here's our last little quote to get us started. And I read that this came from Dolly Parton. I don't know if she's the first person who said it, but I like the idea that it did. So uh, there you go. Look, that's the theme. That's the basic theme for, for uh, what we're going to be looking at today. What specifically will we be looking at? Well, here's the arc of this webinar. Now, I have to admit, there is a lot packed into this webinar. Um, because we're going to make it interactive, we're going to answer some questions and, and do the chat. Uh, we'll get through as much of it as we can. Um, and, uh, and, but the, the key thing to notice with this is that it, it scaffolds. The skills that we we'll look at first are the ones that apply in every situation. And you want to have those skills down before you start to, trying to apply them to things like leading your teams or using these skills to uh, help you with project management and things like that. So there we are. If you have any questions, uh, jump in raise a hand or, or honestly just take yourself off mute and ask a question if it feels like this is important and I really think I didn't understand. Uh, and also you can just put it into chat. We have a bunch of people on the call and we have uh, Marissa and Carly who are uh, handling the chat and making sure that we address concerns uh, either right through chat or still they'll let me know and we'll, we'll talk about them during the session. Okay, so we'll make this into a conversation as much as possible. Uh, we started out with a little bit of good news um, that we all have this in our, in our DNA. And from a neuroscience perspective, you can back that up because we are literally adapting all the time. Your brain is constantly scanning your environment, making predictions, and readjusting. That is how you keep yourself alive. You are adapting all the time. Now, some people are naturally a little bit better at this than others, but it is something that we all do. So what's the problem? Why are you even talking about adaptability? Well, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, and we can... In, particularly true in the workplace, uh, to be good at uh, an adaptability mindset, having resilience uh, helps you to succeed. And these, uh, this is especially true when we're under duress. And of course, right now, there's extra reasons to feel that way. Adaptability is quite literally the ability to adjust to and accommodate to new or changing conditions or environments accommodating and adjusting to uncertainty and ambiguity, even under duress. So what can we do about it? 
if we're struggling? Well, this is exactly what we're going to look at to start off with. And we're going to start with a model. This is a tool that you can practice and you can implement to become more capable at being adaptable. This tool, incidentally, comes by way of the U.S. military. And it was back in 2008. It was um, for the Department of Defense. And they did a, um, a big meta study of other research that was out there around adaptability. And of course, as you can imagine, this is for the U.S military that in the military being able to adapt and be resilient are keys to their success so they they cared a lot about this and they came up with some pretty interesting findings and things that we thought were worth sharing so um this model is there's there's a little bit more to it but we boiled it down to these these three keys uh, mental flexibility emotional intelligence and resilience so adaptability is considered a meta skill and that it requires a combination of other component skills, these, uh, these ones being those component skills. Now, I should point out that there are, of course, other things that contribute to your ability to adapt, including things like your upbringing, your disposition, your experiences, the environment and culture you live in, the organization that you work in. And it's true that the culture, both the society and the workplace, need to support adaptability if it's going to thrive. But it's also true that adaptability isn't a given and you uh, can have some agency around it and you have a certain responsibility for your own adaptability. It doesn't just show up inherently in every individual. Uh, so training yourself for adaptability is probably something that you want to intentionally work on and it takes practice. It's not, it's one of those skills that doesn't happen immediately. It's like a, it's a lifetime skill that you want to keep investing in and reinforcing. And it's tested in crucible moments, which is how you really can measure how you're doing. And, uh, and again, stay, stay positive. We're all on a journey here. Okay, so the first component that we're just going to call out right here is mental flexibility or, or cognitive readiness. And this is how well we deal with information. And for our purposes, uh, it's, we're going to focus especially on your ability to stay curious and use different thinking strategies and mental frameworks to adjust to new information. This is about reframing and not getting stuck in those motivated reasoning traps. Relational component is emotional intelligence, how, deal, how well we deal with people and emotions. And this includes both uh, awareness and management of ourselves. That's uh, self-awareness and self-regulation, as well, as well as awareness and management of our relationships, our social skills, how we read, perceive, and interact with other people. And then finally, resilience, which is about how we deal with challenges. Now, I said that this actually comes from the military, and this I thought was really interesting. Resilience, toughness, hardiness, grit. These are like military things, right? Well, in this uh, research, they actually uh, cited uh, resilience as the least important of, the, of these three skills. Um, so they included it. They think it's important. It needs to be in there. But if you're going to pick just two out of those three, they said the most important ones for having an adaptability mindset is uh, emotional intelligence and mental flexibility. By the way, the researchers were uh, Freemans and Burns. And uh, this, is, this uh, document is called Developing an Adaptability Training Strategy, if you want to look it up. Let's look at mental flexibility first. Uh, it's essentially how mentally adaptable we are, how skilled we are at processing and navigating changes and things like rules and information and deci decision-making criteria. Whoops, sorry, we're right here. Um, <clears throat> so what does this look like? It includes things like critical, creative, and intuitive thinking. It's your ability to see various points of view, recognize patterns and hidden relationships that allow you to find new solutions. This allows you to see when what you're doing isn't working and you need to adjust. This is th that's getting out of the sunk cost fallacy trap, which is one of those cognitive biases where you've invested a lot of time and you don't want to give up and you just hold on even tighter. Uh, this is tolerance for change and a willingness to embrace alternative solutions. And... Um, from F. Scott Fitzgerald, another, another literary reference for the day. It's also that uh, ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. 
So how do you work on your mental flexibility? Well, here's a tool that you can use, and this will help you clear up some cloudy thinking. And it's adapted from a BBC wellness offering, and it has roots in cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which is about managing your negative thoughts. Look, if mental flexibility is about building good, critical, creative, and intuitive thinking, well, what gives, gets in the way of that? So often it's fear. Adaptability is hard when the future is uncertain, when risks are big, time is short, the, the, the deadline is looming and everyone is looking at you. So this tool right here, the three C's, is particularly good at helping you stop fear from clouding your thoughts so you can exhibit the traits that we just talked about with good mental flexibility. So the first thing to do is to catch it. That basically just means notice your thinking. What assumptions are you making right now? Is this fear or negativity driving your thinking? Use your emotions as cues. Test your gut. Are you feeling anxious and uncomfortable? Are you feeling certain and inflexible? People make decisions based on what their gut tells them. So you have to check that gut feeling, which is actually really hard to do because it's, it's hard to question that. But this is the first step under, under pressure is question, take, examine that gut feeling. The next step is to check it. This is where you test those thoughts and feelings. And you ask, okay, what's factually correct here? What's the real issue? Ask, what do we not know? Looking for those unknowns, those did that disconfirming evidence in the situation can help you see those alternative viewpoints that separate facts from emotional reactions. Uh, if you uh, know about counterfactuals, this is a good place for that. Basically, a counterfactual is imagining alternative scenarios as a way to check your thinking. As I said, this is hard to do because it's really hard to go against what your gut tells you, even when you know it. They did some research with parole board judges in uh, Australia and found that <clears throat> right before lunch, they would meet out tougher sentencing because they were hungry and their gut was telling them that something was wrong and they tended to interpret it a little bit uh, um, and, and attribute it to the people who were standing in front of them for sentencing. Even after the judges knew this, they still did the same thing. It's hard to check your gut, but under pressure, and if you're going to really uh, have an adaptable mindset, this is one of those things that you want to get good at it. Um, you can also use this to check your co for cognitive miscues, and that's how you frame things. So say your company recognizes that there are some serious gender gaps in senior roles. And they frame the problem as, we haven't trained enough women in the organization to become leaders. Now that may be true, but if you're checking your critical and creative thinking, then you'll notice that the frame begs the solution, which is more training for women. And that limits the possibilities. Before you know it, you start heading down a path, you invest a bunch of time and energy, and then finally you realize that trying to improve diversity uh, of people in the company who are in senior roles isn't really about training the women as much as it's maybe about training the men. Uh, that's one example. Sort of, sort of takes us down a whole a different path, but it's just an example of how the frame itself leads the thinking. So do you need to change the frame? You need to check that frame for miscues. The final piece is just that change. Oh, um, I've never been here before. We're here for a nine o'clock appointment. Uh, I think we still have some people not quite on mute. I'll make sure that I monitor mine to see that I'm... Okay, great. So um, change it. This is your opportunity to reframe biased thinking and feelings. What options can I see? What impact can I have in times of stress and change? Um, it's, a power, it's empowering to take stock and realize that you do have some agency. You can influence your problem solving. You can make changes. Um, it's just to take a realistic assessment and, um, and decide if you want to change something and then take action. Questions you can ask are things like, how will I feel about this decision a year from now? Uh, you, another question you can ask to get you into a curious frame of mind is what learning opportunity is here? And with that, I'm gonna come to, uh, to you all. We, we covered 
a bit already about the, the key components of adaptability, which is your EQ, your mental flexibility and resilience. We're looking right now at mental flexibility. We've got this model of the three C's as a, as a shorthand way to just check your mental flexibility in your thinking. What questions do we have in chat so far um, or do we? Now let's go to Carly. Hey, Darren. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like Deidre, um, and Deidre, if you want to come off mute and kind of specify, but looks like maybe some clarification on exactly what cognitive flexibility is. Um, yeah. It looks like that may have been one of the questions that came through. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, help uh, clarify that. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to adapt. So if you if you jump into an idea, you you know what it is that you want to do. That seems like the right solution. You take sort of a, a position on something, and you lock in. And it's it's an inability to step outside and see the frame from a different point of view, and to uh, to look at the whole picture. Mental flexibility yeah. is your ability to change your mind. Um, okay. I appreciate that. I, I had uh, cognitive flexibility written on my board like from two years ago. So when you started talking about mental flexibility, then I wondered. Yeah, you know, same. same. So your explanation clarifies that for yeah. me. Thank you so yeah. much. Yes, I think they're pretty much the same, unless I'm, I'm misunderstanding. Uh, let me check in with a couple of our um, panelists, which I've just decided to call you. And um, how about uh, Sarah G? Sarah G, that almost looked like a hand that you had raised. It's probably not the case. And she's like, no, no, I don't have anything. I think this is all good. Um, anything to add, Sarah G, to the conversation? And you don't need just, just thoughts. Uh, I unmuted, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, not yet. These are all things I'm interested in learning, um, not only from my work, but I'm being faced with elder care. And um, yeah. it's a whole new world. And um, I find myself buffeted every day with, into situations that um, I've never dealt with. And I need to learn how to be more flexible in dealing with staff. My mother lives 1,500 miles away, and I'm trying to have her age at home with 24-7 caregivers. And they're very different people. They live in the Midwest, and, and um, I'm a Californian, and there's just huge differences. So this is really good. <laughs> I need this. Putting yourself in their space is going to help you and being curious for sure. And it's hard sometimes to do. Um, I, you know, I, I think the recommendation I'd have for all of you is pick one or two things that you want to just remind yourself to do. Remind yourself to check your thinking by looking for disconfirming evidence. What is it that I don't know here? What am I missing? Um, check yourself to just see, take the temperature of like, how committed are you to this idea? Um, um, uh, find a thing. Another really great thing to do is just make sure that you have clarity in your thinking is to write stuff down. Uh, right. When you write stuff down, it forces you to um, examine your thinking for structure because the, for, the writing forces a structure. So if your logic is deductive or inductive, you start looking at it on the page and you can start to identify where the gaps are. So uh, writing is a good, is another good way to check your, um, check your thinking. All right. Oh yeah, got a hand over here, and I'm sorry I don't see your name in the chat window. So, um, who is that uh, with? Hi. I think that's me, yeah. Alice. Yes, yes. Hey, uh, so I was just reminded um, of something that I have learned to do recently, which is when I'm faced with um, a problem that I have to solve. I was told that rarely is your first idea the best idea, but sometimes it's hard to think of a second idea because your first one seems pretty good to you. <laughs> so yeah. what I do is I'll write down the question and then I'll write down the answer. And then I write down the question again and I write down a different answer. And I just keep drilling down until it gets interesting. Sometimes I, that works. I think that is an outstanding recommendation. It is something that we teach as well, that uh, that first answer is uh, is really your best answer, but it's convenient and we're all under a time pressure. And I love that you're using a, um, a, a process for, for drilling down. It doesn't mean that you won't go back to your first answer and decide that it's good sometimes, but we have a tendency to just latch onto that and move on. So I think that's a great practice. Uh, I to make just, oh, sorry. I just wanted to yeah, make go this. Um, you know, I, I didn't know that. I, that's news to me that you said that when you write something down that that creates structure, I mean, or forces structure. That's really interesting. 
Yeah, I mean, it depends a little bit on how you write. I, if I'm going to write something down, I wouldn't get too. I, I sort of get my ideas down on the page, and then I'd look to restructure them into um, what's the real problem that I'm trying to solve, what's the solution, and I check my thinking for it. Like if I have a bunch of like things that I'm trying to say, well, these are all similar, so it must prove this point. Okay. Um, you know, business is down in Europe, business is down for us in Asia, business is down in Americas, you know, there's something happening in the world that's causing all the business to be down in our sector. Um, that's making a logical argument. But I, 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 then what you do is you check and you see, well, are all those things actually all the same? Or have I like put something in a category that doesn't belong in? Um, when you're being thoughtful and you're really thinking through your ideas, writing is a thinking tool as much as it's a communication tool. So it is it's really helpful. That way. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I should push ahead a little bit because I want to get into those other things. Thanks for the thumbs up, Allie. Uh, here we go. Let's look at next um, emotional intelligence. This is such a big one and it's been around for a while. I mean, this is really goes back to Daniel Goleman is the researcher and author who introduced this term emotional intelligence into our, our lexicon. And he persuasively argued that EQ is as important, if not more important than IQ when it comes to workplace success. His most famous book is Emotional Intelligence, one and a half years in the New York Times bestseller. And that was in 1995. So he, this is a super quick little tour through this, but he basically breaks the model down into two main components. Um, the, the first component when it comes to emotional intelligence is really about um, ourselves. It's our own uh, self-awareness and self-management, self-regulation. It's, it's taking um, the temperature of what's going on inside and then also your ability to manage that, uh, those feelings. For example, uh, if you've had the experience of ruminating on something that's really driving you crazy and you spend so much time ruminating on it that it, it, it creates problems because you've lost perspective. That would be an example of poor self-regulation or self-management. Um, here's uh, the other side of it is in relationship to other people. It's your social awareness. It's your social skills. Um, again, this is a pretty short version of everything that he uh, talked about, but th these are the basic two categories and the ones that we want to focus on when we're working on our own adaptability. Um, let me uh, talk about uh, we're going to come back to the to the the part that's about yourself in a in a moment, but let me just call it a couple of things about when it comes to other people. One is uh, empathy. The difference between empathy and sympathy. This is a super easy shorthand. Um, my wife's actually a therapist, and she uses this. I think uh, I think that's where I heard it. Uh, empathy is feeling with, and sympathy is feeling for. Uh, empathy is um, is uh, is powerful in that way, whereas sympathy can be kind of off-putting. And all it just means is that you try to step in someone else's shoes and experience a little bit of what that feels like. And the, the danger that I mostly see people fall into when, about expressing empathy is it's important to remember that empathy does not mean agreement. You can empathize with somebody and feel with them and put yourself in their shoes, but it doesn't mean that you agree with the choices they've made, the decisions they've made, or what actions you should all take. It just means that you get it. And when people see you get it, that's how you build uh, those bonds and then tough situations where you need to be adaptive, um, this is a great skill to have. This is another one that I think is really an interesting way to frame this. And this is your ability to be in concert with other people. If you pluck a string on a violin, it will set any other thing, a string, a tuning fork, whatever it is that is tuned to that same frequency, it will set it in motion. It resonates because they're in rapport with each other. They're both in tune. And that's a metaphor what's, for what psychological attunement is. And it basically means that you're trying to um, get where someone else is at, connect with where they're at, build rapport with where they're at. And you do that by matching them a little bit. So if you're uh, in a state that's um, emotional about something and, and you could see that others are like really getting quiet and, and backing down, then you're, you're breaking that attunement and that bond and what you might wanna do is slow down and try to get more in tune with everyone else around you. I mean, in some ways, attunement is just an, another sort of fancy word for being able to read people. And, um, and, but it's a good metaphor, I think, for like, and a good word for how you do that. 
Let's take a quick look at um, this first part of this. Uh, emotional intelligence results in better adaptability. This comes uh, from uh, research that was done in the Harvard Business Review is where this was published, Five Ways to Boost Your Resilience at Work. This is from uh, 2016, I think. And 75% uh, of the workforce reports experiencing moderate to high levels of stress. And this stress really affects our ability to, be, um, to regulate ourselves emotionally. This is, this is one of those things in a situation where you need to be adaptable that's impeding your ability to have good EQ because you're just under stress. So managing your stress is one way to bring your EQ up. And what can you use to do that? Well, mindfulness. Uh, have uh, Mindfulness has been shown to um, do, uh, do a lot of good when it comes to being able to, um, to be present, to uh, repair that emotional intelligence, to, uh, to show up with all of your cognitive faculties, and um, even in these trying times. And if you hear construction down the street, well, there you go, trying times, right? I'm, of course, doing this from my home. Uh, mindfulness and leadership effectiveness. This is just some pretty good stats to, to take a quick look at, to just show how big a deal um, mindfulness actually is. This comes from uh, Deconstructing the Relationship Between Mindfulness and Leader Effectiveness. It was published in the Leadership and Organization Development Journal, um, issue number 39. It's researched by Dr. Dr. Matthew Lippincourt at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was with 11, through 11 different countries um, and across uh, uh, various industries. Okay, so mindfulness. All right, yeah, sure, that sounds great. What exactly is mindfulness? Well, as, as Carly mentioned, I have an actor background, and actors have this adage, which is that you should never go on stage with children or animals. And that's because uh, small children, especially, and animals are really in the moment. They are 100% present, and it doesn't matter what they're doing, they are immediately more interesting and captivating than you are. Well, mindfulness is that. It's that just being in the moment, being present. Plus, it's not being reactive, reactionary. It's not, it's not being overwhelmed. It's a certain kind of being present in the moment, calm, alive. And how do you do that? Well, here's a nice little framework that looks remarkably similar to catch it, check it, and change it. Pause, notice, breathe and choose. And I, that's pretty straight on, I would say. Um, <clears throat> pause can be difficult. In theory, it sounds great, but when you're actually in that moment of stress, this is the, you can forget that very first step, which is to just stop, pause, notice how you're doing. This is like that same catch it kind of thing. And then breathe. And honestly, I think you wanna combine this tool with the three Cs because they work really well together. Notice how you're doing. You've paused. You notice how you're doing and breathe. Our bodies have a built-in stress relief valve, which is breathing. Breathing is scientifically proven to affect the heart, the brain, the immune system, digestion, even gene expression. And it's reinforced by how you breathe. Deep breathing turns on the vagus nerve in our brain, which puts the brakes on our stress responses. Uh, your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, sympathetic is breathing in and it's more of a stress activator. Parasympathetic is connected to breathing out, which is a calmer, a relaxer. It alleviates stress. So ideally, you want to breathe out longer than you breathe in. And you want those breaths to be deep, to, to not just be in the upper part of your chest, but to always to drop all the way down. Then you've done this and you can choose. Um, it's not always easy to do, but uh, you wanna create that opportunity for yourself to choose how you decide to behave in that situation. So we're gonna do a quick little exercise together. Wherever you are, uh, take a moment to just think through a situation that triggers you. 
a kind of a situation that triggers your stress level so that right away you can feel yourself getting into that space where you're not being adaptive, you're just being reactive and everything starts to fall apart. It could be a situation at work, it could be a situation at home, it could be something that happens frequently around systems or processes at work, it could be a person or a certain personality that triggers you, but try to picture that scenario. Picture it in your mind's eye. Close your eyes if you want, but this, you have to, the trick is setting the implementation intention for this to happen when you need it. So right now, if you can picture the situation, a situation that triggers you and fill in the details, what does it look like? Who's there? What is, what is, what are the sounds? What are the smells? Paint the picture for yourself and imagine exactly that moment that you get triggered. Now set the intention for yourself to pause. Feel what it feels like to pause in that moment. Check in, just notice how you're doing and breathe and we'll go ahead and do it. In, out, one more time. and then choose. How do you want to respond? I'm not telling you how you need to respond, but you get to choose. Now, hopefully that worked for you. If you didn't, try it again in some other situations because uh, if it's working well, you should notice a pretty big difference between how you felt just moments earlier with something that was triggering you because you started to paint the details in. And then by simply pausing, noticing, and two really good breaths, uh, you should hopefully feel a difference, like a, a pretty significant difference. Now, that's a great laboratory little scenario because we can completely control everything. But as we said, adaptability is a skill that takes a lot of practice and work. And this is part of the way that you want to do this. Picture yourself um, uh, doing this. Let me stop and check in with the group uh, and see how we're doing. Uh, Marissa, Carly, any questions or comments or things that have shown up in chat? And, and after that, just to give you a heads up, I am going to come to uh, Joel. Uh, Ar, 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 Joel Arkey? Ar anyway, Joel, I, there you're sitting up, you know exactly who I'm talking to. Let me, so I'm giving you a chance to think what whatever you wanna say. And while you're doing that, uh, Carly, what uh, do we have anything in chat? Nothing specifically came um, came through chat, um, but Darren, I actually have one question before you move to Joel. Is um, with with mindfulness, I think sometimes it gets confused, or, or I just get confused with like a sense of of just being like of like like just presence. So, is there a difference between mindfulness and just like being present, um, or or is it really just that it's like that, that like acknowledgement of being in the moment, if that makes sense? I think it does. And um, I mean, I have to confess, I'm not, I actually think you're quite good at mindfulness, that, that that's a practice of yours. So you might even know better than me. And so correct me if you feel free, if, you, if I'm wrong. But um, the way that I understand it to be is it's yes, it's getting yourself in the present moment. If I'm an actor, well, I am an actor, but let's say I'm an actor on stage and I suddenly get nervous. I get self-conscious. I, I start thinking about, I wonder what my next line is, or I just, or I start thinking about, I wonder, you know, how I'm going to, what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight. And I'm out of the moment. Uh, a trick that I would use is to just finger a button, you know, some button on my clothes and feel the button itself in that moment of being nervous and anxious would ground me in the present moment instead of being lost in my thoughts. It's not disruptive. People can't really see what you're doing, but it's, you know, I'm just thinking, but feeling that button and really feeling it, like actually the roundness of it, the smoothness of it, how it feels in your fingertips that gets you into the present moment, which is sort of my version of mindfulness. And actually the funny thing is I, I believe that's similar to the work that you would want to do if you stop, if you suffer from real, um, uh, uh, panic attacks. So it's, um, just get get into the actual moment you're in instead of your imagination. Mm -hmm. Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you. Thank sure. you. All right, Joel. Thank you for sitting there thinking about what you want to say. What have you got for us, Joel? Well, you mentioned about being like when you do this exercise, being in the moment. Well, how do you know if you're in the moment or if you're just, you know, it's just an illusion at some point? 
Yeah, uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great question. I, honestly, I don't even know if all of this is an illusion or if it's real. That's a whole other philosophical discussion for me that you just brought up. But um, I think that, uh, how do you know if you're, if you're really being present? I think if you start with the things that you can confirm with just literal empirical evidence, like, like touching the, the table in front of you, um, smelling the air, look at the walls and, and like, what color is that wall? Essentially, you're taking yourself out of the moment of all those thoughts that are starting to stress you out. Like, for example, if you start thinking about all the emails that are piling up right now while you're attending this class, you're going to start to feel a sense of anxiety. If you start to think about all the work that you have to do later today, you're going to feel a sense of anxiety. If you want to stop that, just get in this moment right now. Then from there, see where that, that hopefully, hopefully reset you so you can um, proceed. Is that, is that helpful, Joel? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, so going, being in the moment, right? Because personally, I'm a huge person that I really forget about the moment. I just forget, I just make a point in time, like I want this goal and I just see the future. But how do you transition back? You know, maybe if this... Well, I, I think I should point out that it doesn't mean that you can't get in your thoughts or get in your imagination or predict the, you know, imagine a future that doesn't exist and paint the picture of your goals. Like that's all really helpful. But here's, uh, here's where it sort of connects. Um, if you spend, if you, if you visualize success shows is shown to have benefits, but if you spend, Carly, we're gonna have to start wrapping it up here pretty soon, aren't we? If you spend all of your time visualizing that success and you achieving success and what it feels like after you've accomplished this goal, it can actually be demotivating. You wanna know what you're shooting for, but what you don't wanna lose sight of is the work along the way. So if you have a big goal, you wanna actually visualize yourself doing the work. You know, if your goal is to run a marathon, you want to visualize yourself getting up in the morning, having your cup of coffee and right at 710 when you hit the road, hitting the road, picture yourself putting on your shoes, picture that first mile marker that you see. Um, those are the things that keep you on track. And so they're, they're kind of more connected to what's immediate. And I, I think that's, that's how you don't get too lost in your thoughts. Thank you so much there. I appreciate yeah. it. So Carly, how much time should I reasonably take from here? Yeah, thanks, Darren. I think we probably have, uh, we have about 10 more minutes um, before we'll want to wrap up. Um, we do have one more really great question from Kathleen. Do you want to save that? We can save it till the end. Um, uh, let me, yeah, let me do a little bit of a quick walk through resilience because it's the last little piece that we have here. And I got a, a, a little bit of recommendation about that. And um, here we go. So uh, uh, resili resilience is, is really just what allows you to keep uh, practicing that mental flexibility, to keep practicing good EQ. It, it supports these other two. And uh, here's a great quote from Viktor Frankl, who, who's a terrific psychologist who's, who lived through the Holocaust and, and who's responsible for adding this idea to our, under, to our collective understanding that meaning in life is important. Is important. And without meaning, um, it's really difficult for human beings to survive. It's almost like a fundamental need. And uh, this is a quote with, uh, from him that, that really uh, helps to um, jump into that territory. So being able to find meaning and having a positive outlook, and it doesn't mean like a Pollyanna outlook, you still want to be realistic about things, but you have to recognize that people have a predisposition for negativity. Um, on a very basic level, our brains are hard hardwired to look for and focus on threats. Uh, this is why we uh, do things like um, uh, we tend to respond more strongly to negative situations. We tend to remember negative events in greater and more accurate detail. We spend more time uh, thinking about and processing negative events and negative information. And why are you doing that? So that you can avoid those circumstances in the future. This is, a, it's, it's just, biology it's, it's it's how it's how we it's how we ended up here this is how how you make sure to avoid um these pitfalls that can happen in your life right so because of that we do have this uh tendency to to lean towards um negativity lisa 
uh, yeah, what do you have, Lisa? Well, I'm thinking, doesn't that kind of keep us back? I mean, from, from you know, being successful, if that it's, it seems like that would hold us back. We're kind of being self-protective, right? Yeah, well, that's the, exactly the trap. Like, you do want to be able to look at a situation and say, okay, how could we have done this better? You want to learn from your mistakes. And if you're truly adaptable, you need to live in an environment, in a, you need to create an environment for yourself and others where it's okay to make mistakes, which means you'll have some negative experiences. How you process that negative experience is really important for your future growth. But what you don't want to slip into is um, sort of a spiral of negativity about it and fear. So it's basically just a reminder to check that, hey, I do have a negativity bias. So when I look back on my life, um, it can often be easy for me to see those negative things because they stand out and miss a lot of the good things. Uh, so thank you for that. That's, that's pretty much exactly what I'm teeing up here in this next little slide is when faced with a challenge or problem, take a moment to review in real time something that is going well. So let's say I suddenly confront a problem. We were working on a, on a project. Everything looked great. And then we suddenly have this big problem that I didn't even think. And I have to go report to senior management in like in the next 45 minutes. And I don't even know what to do. And I'm starting to panic. Um, slow down. You stop. In, interrupt that. And you can do it with the, the, the same tools that we already just looked at. And you can do this. What's going well? Picture what's going, anything that's going well in your life. And this is like a cleanser for your thoughts. It does not need to be related to what you're what just confronted, just anything that's going well in your life. It's like, well, this is a setback, but I'm doing really well in my progress towards that marathon. And I feel like I'm becoming a runner. Then the next step is to go back to the problem. Now, now I'm going to confront that challenge of the problem. I've also done some breathing and things like that. For the challenge or problem, what is something I can improve or take action on? What is one thing that I can take action on right now that's going to uh, set me up for success? Now, I, 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 my point of view is you don't want to let that interrupt good thinking about it. You know, maybe so let me so I, I've just been confronted with a problem. What does it really mean? Is there anything that I'm missing here? Am I focusing on the actual problem or just my fear about this problem? But before I leave questioning the, the frame and looking for solutions, I do want to find one positive action to take, one, one thing that I can improve. And part of that is because what's inherently motivating for all of us in our inner work life, our just sort of daily, uh, certainly being at work, but even just out in the world, is a feeling of constant measured success, like small success in things that matter in anything that's meaningful. So if I can pull one positive thing that I can do, one positive thing I can improve on, um, I help cleanse out some of that negativity that might disrupt my ability to be adaptable, adaptive, adaptable, you know what I mean, and resilient. So here's my last question. I think this is a place to, to end on. And if we have some questions about um, uh, teams a little bit more specifically, or, or projects and we have time, I'll, I'll jump into it. But what do you do to build resilience? Um, and uh, let's see if people have, because look, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people on this call who are probably doing great things to build their own resilience that other people could benefit from. And I am gonna um, put one of my friends on the spot and I'm gonna ask, um, uh, Jacqueline Harris to jump in. She's going to hate me for this, but I'm going to give you a moment to prepare. And I'm first going to, going to I would no, like. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jacqueline Harris, I know that you have practiced resilience in your life. Um, yeah. You, what, what's, what's the thing that, that you feel like has really served you well? Um, I, I think breaking things into bite-sized pieces, um, you gave a number of examples uh, and they can be overwhelming. And I found that it's, for me, it's putting it on a whiteboard and saying, this isn't this big overwhelming project. It's, it's this piece, one piece, two piece, three piece, uh, take it one at a time. And then you look up and you've conquered it. So, so that helps me build resilience is, and not being overwhelmed by the enormity of the project issue or problem, but saying, what are the bite-sized pieces I can break this into? And then that rolls back into what you're 
you were talking about, then I can say, hey, what's going well? Well, yeah. I've knocked out a couple of pieces. What yeah. can I do to improve, right? So yeah. uh, bite-sized pieces is, is, is mine. I think that's really good advice and, uh, and, and absolutely the way to tackle anything, especially big. And it reminds me of a great book. I don't know if you've read this one. It's uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, which is a really great reference for, um, and it's kind of a, a good overview of the current thinking about uh, changing behavior and habits, building new and better habits. And uh, I mean, that's it, it's small bite-sized pieces. Um, Carly, um, Marissa, any, um, anything showing up in chat for us and, um, yeah. And then we have a hand up right over there and I'm sorry, I don't see, see your name, but, uh, the physical hand showed up and then I think we maybe have an, uh, yeah. So is that me? That's you. That's what I was meaning to say. Yes. On chat, it, I can't see your name. So oh, it's like, uh, yeah. So no, one thing I was just thinking about that has really helped me the last a year, a couple of years is just a recognition of my own working style. Um, I used to get really just so flustered with things because um, it takes me a long time to make decisions and also to just sort of process. It's actually a more of a processing thing. It takes me a really long time to process information. And I used to always get tied up, I'd make, I'd, I'd jump into things, I'd try to answer someone way before I was ready for it because I felt like I needed to and I had to. Um, and just the recognition that I don't have to, that I can say, I, I need more time on that, um, yeah. I'll get back to you. That has made a huge difference for me over the past couple of years and that that's okay that I work slowly, that I don't have an answer immediately, um, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I know a lot of people uh, have that experience. I certainly have that experience sometimes myself too, but you found such a good, it's like you need evidence to know that it's okay. It's like you have to test it out. And so the recommendation is like, I think at least right on, if anybody else has a similar experience, try it out in a low stakes situation and just stop, breathe and say, you know what? I need a little more time to think about this and then see what happens. Is there a cost? Does it, does it work? Do people like say, what do you mean? I need an answer now. You build some empirical evidence for yourself so that you feel like you can bring it out into the world. I believe that you will be able to, obviously Elisa was able to as well, but, but uh, create some proof for yourself. Uh, Daria Davies from London, England, all the way uh, across the pond. Um, yeah. What do you Very think? nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Uh, what do you think about uh, what we've covered so far and, and resilience for yourself? Um, anything stand out or thing or thing for you that that you'd like to share? Well, um, I mean, for me, it was always a specific situation because I um, I am an accountant. That means that I always have like due dates and they are quite fixed. So you know, you need to get um, work done by a certain um, time. And yeah, I think I will, I will practice um, a bit of, of, of the C, uh, you know, the C exercises, because um, I feel like you, you, you really should control your, your mind. Yeah. And at the end, um, you have the power and you, you really need to recognize it, you know, that you have the power. It's really up to you how you deal with this kind of stress and it takes a lot of work for sure yeah. <laughs> uh, i know that but um yeah it's a good uh, moment or at least it's the first step to to see it that yeah. that i have the power of it yeah yeah well to, to believe that you have some agency i think that's yeah. important i mean don't beat yourself up if you don't do it perfectly all the time i don't want people to think that you have like perfect agency in every moment, but we often have a lot more than we realize and, and believing in it matters. Um, here's an example of uh, controlling your thoughts. So everybody quick, don't think of an elephant. It doesn't work, does it? It's like not, it's like you have to think of an elephant to not think of an elephant. Uh, for me, that's what, that's an example of those intrusive thoughts that show up where you find yourself cycling and you can't let go of something. If you're practicing mindfulness about it, uh, then you just do the same thing we're talking about. Uh, pause, notice it, catch it, breathe. And then uh, the action that you can take is to just invite the thought to gently go. When it becomes difficult for people is when they start beating themselves up for having the thought in the, the thought in the first place. Uh, 
So that's really where it gets to be difficult. Not that it showed up, but just that you started beating yourself up and you couldn't let go of it. And it really wasn't necessarily exactly what you're talking about, Daria, but it, it popped into my head. So I decided to share it anyway. Um, anything else from the group? Uh, Marissa, I know you've been looking at chat too, and um, you always have some fascinating things to say um, in your, in, in, and I just decided to put you on the spot. That was really basically, I decided to put Marissa on the spot. I think? always have fascinating things to say. Oh, is it, what, a, what a tea up. Now everybody's like, oh, I better listen to Marissa. It's going to be fascinating. Um, as far as the chat goes, well, we don't have any more questions. However, there was one that had come up earlier. Um, do you have quickly, because I know we're running out of time here, but any suggestions to do this when you're in the middle of a conversation? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes the expectation for a response makes it very difficult to pause. And I know we addressed it a little bit, but that was something that had come up earlier. Yeah. So that those, there's a lot of subtle little cues that happen in conversations between people, and they are slightly different from culture to culture. But in all the cultures they think are represented here, unless I'm mistaken, um, it, there's, there's a lot of weird consistency. It turns out that in a natural flow of a conversation, there's a gap of only 200 milliseconds from when one person talks to another person talks, when you're kind of in flow with each other. Um, so managing all that, and if you wanna take some time and process something before you jump in uh, and, and say something, you, you kind of manage with your prosody, how you modulate your voice, you manage it a little bit with your body and you manage it with your own expectations, like Elise said, in terms of like, what do you need to step in with? I think people don't realize that if you, if you take time to formulate your thoughts and you take some pauses, what you actually teach people to do is pay attention. It feels like I never get a chance to, to talk because I don't jump in quick enough and I, and I don't dominate the conversation. I don't have a million things to say, but there's another side of it, which is that when you have the floor, if you take time, you don't repeat yourself. You teach people to pay attention to what you say and you actually end up having more power and authority. So um, I don't know how helpful that was, but um, it's okay to take some time. And uh, you can also just say, you know what? I need a little bit of time to think about this. No, that was great, Darren. All of this information was great. And like we've said multiple times, given the year everybody had in 2020, I think having to adapt was something we all didn't expect we were going to have to do, but we did it anyways. And now with sessions like this, we could be more prepared in 2021. So thank you, Darren. That was awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Carly, I think I can pass it over to you now, yeah? Amazing, yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody for your interaction today. Uh, it was really fun to see, it, some, see some fresh faces chiming in. Um, and Elise, your point really resonated with me. So I'm someone that uh, definitely has to take a little bit more time as well. So that really resonates. Um, before we wrap up, thank you. Everyone's already saying their thanks. Yeah, if, if you enjoyed today's session, give us a little bit of love in the chat. Uh, we'd love to receive your feedback. And I'll be sending a survey out for, for your feedback as well. We're, we're really looking to iterate on these sessions and, and make them relevant for our, our worldwide group. Um, and with that, the sessions, this session will be available in offsite. I'm going to share a quick video really quick that gives more of a high level of what offsite is. Um, but just to give all of you just the quick benefits of the platform, the most immediate being access to today's recording and the slides from today. Uh, there's also live instructor help available in offsite. So our promise to you is that our team of instructors will get back to any question you ask within 48 hours. Um, so say you have another follow-up question please pose it to us in offsite in the platform uh, and we'll get back to you. And there are also exclusive discounts on Learn It classes available to offsite members. So offsite is free to join. You just need to add your, your first and last name and email. Um, and we'd love to see you in there. And so with that, we'll close it with a, a quick video on offsite. Um, so you can find out a little bit more info. And uh, Marissa, if you can actually drop the link to offsite, uh, the referral link, that would be amazing. And we can, um, I'll go ahead and share that video. Whoop, wrong screen. 
Hello, and welcome to Offsite by Learn It. I'm Carly, community lead. Offsite is a new online community dedicated to fostering the principles, skills, and connections needed to thrive in the new normal. It's a place you can go to reconnect with your professional goals and aspirations and find answers by collaborating with a group of intelligent people from all over the world. And now more than ever, with the crisis affecting everyone in some way, we are all looking for safe, inclusive spaces to connect with each other, to learn new things about the topics that matter most, and to grow together personally and professionally. So whether you are working on your own personal growth, working with technology, working with others, or leading people in teams, Offsite can help. Offsite is organized by topic. So if you're looking for career advice, insights on business, free workshops, or a good book on leadership, it's all on Offsite. And in the spirit of community, we are looking to you to help us shape this platform. We encourage you to engage with your peers and instructors, share your thoughts, and ask questions. The more you put into it, the more you get out of it. We are so excited to be launching this online community, and we can't wait to see you here. Thank you again, everybody. Uh, thanks, Daria. Appreciate your feedback. Uh, I will stick around for a couple of minutes if you have any questions about Offsite. Thank you, Marissa, for putting the referral link in there. So you can go ahead and click click on the link in the chat um, to join. And, uh, and you can also go straight to Offsite by Learn It to be directed to the platform. So thank you again to Darren. Thank you to everybody here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see you next, next Friday. Uh, we have our last event of the month coming up. And in February, we'll be focusing on data visualization. So uh, if you're interested in, we have a lot of fun workshops coming up as well. Yes, it's the same time uh, every Friday, Daria. Always the same time, 8.30 a.m. PST. I just put the link to our events calendar that is in offsite. Uh, oh, it looks like I just chatted it to Marissa. But if you want to view the rest of our events calendar, that's available there as well. All right, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks so much, everyone.